Good morning or good afternoon, students and to whomever is watching this. Um, uh, I'm not sure what time this is going to be at because these are now video lectures, but welcome to the class on torts. My name is Mike Stewart and I'm here to teach you about torts in the APSC 450 class. You are probably wondering uh, why I am here to teach you this and in fact, why are you here to learn about torts? Well, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, I assume that all of you are engineers of some kind or computer scientists or in biotech or some combination of these programs. Well, if you are, then the reason why you're here is because you will interact with the law in many ways over the course of your career. And I assume you want to be here as well for a couple of important reasons. Number one is you probably want to avoid lawsuits, which I'm going to tell you about later. Number two is you probably want to advance your career. And the third is you want to be good professionals and eventually become professional engineers like myself. So who am I and why am I teaching this class? Well, my background is as an engineer. I am a chemical engineer. I worked for about four years in oil and gas and power and research before obtaining my professional engineering designation. I then went on to become a lawyer. Um, and since I became a lawyer, I started teaching this class. I've been teaching this class for about two years now, and this is the first time we've done it on video lectures, which I'm happy to do um, because it makes it much easier for everybody to review these at their own leisure. And I teach this course because I enjoy it. I love teaching fellow engineers about the law. It's something that I became very interested in myself, in, for myself when I was going through undergrad. Um, a lot of people ask me, why? How did I get here? How did I go from an engineer to becoming a lawyer? And uh, I always tell them the story. I was in this class, this engineering law class, but at the University of Ottawa in undergrad. And the professor who taught this class was just so charismatic. He had this entire PowerPoint presentation in his mind. Um, and he was an engineer and a lawyer. And I was so impressed with him, I asked him, you know, how did you get to speak like this? Because all of my other professors in engineering, uh, they were very good at math, but maybe not so good at speaking. And he said, I went to law school. And so that's what I decided to do. I went to law school, and through going to law school, I overcame my fear of presentations, and I eventually started to like giving presentations, which is why I'm now here giving you this presentation. So without further ado, let's talk about the um, topics in this course. I am only going to be speaking to two of them this time around. I will speak about torts and I will speak about employment law. Um, this first lecture is about torts, the next one will be about employment law. The others that are listed here, you will probably have another speaker speak about, including an introduction to the legal system, which I assume you've already uh, heard at this point. Um, criminal law, a little bit I'll speak about. There will be contract law, intellectual property law, environmental law, Aboriginal law, and business law. I expect you'll get a little bit of all of these things. The other portion of this class, which you probably, probably already know, is um, the professional regulation component to it. And there will be another lecture on that. So um, without further ado, let's, let's deal with the torts. I'm sure you recognize these two uh, fine looking characters. These two, for those who don't know, they're from the show Suits. I was asked recently by uh, one of my clients um, about whether this show was accurate. Essentially, she, she said to me this. She said, I saw Harvey Specter, the gentleman there on the right, approach the judge and negotiate with the judge to get a good resolution for his client's case. And she said, can you do that for me? And my answer was, no. That's not how it works. But I will say this. The other stuff that happens in this show about all the drama that happens in a law firm, that is largely accurate. At one point, I worked at a large law firm and all of the uh, fun things that happened in that show they, they are pretty accurate. Just the way the law works, it's not quite right. So let me give you some examples of, of how the law actually works. And I'm going to start with talking about the common law. This was probably introduced to you a little bit earlier uh, by another one of the lecturers. Um, so this might be a bit of a refresher. The common law, as opposed to legislation, is an area of law that is made by judges. Judges over the period of a long time developed this law to help the common people, that is you and I, to deal with their legal problems. Typically the common law deals with rights as between individuals, not so much dealing with rights as between individuals and the state. 
that is the country, Canada. So the common law is judge-made law that helps people deal with their problems. In dealing with torts, there are a number of terms that I've listed here on the next two slides, that some of which I think are going to be important, especially if you look at case law. There, uh, the, the two important terms I'm going to mention now are plaintiff and defendant. So the plaintiff is the one suing, is the person who is bringing the lawsuit. Think of it like this. The plaintiff pleads their case. In oldie times, the plaintiff would go to the high lords and say, please, please um, give me the relief I'm seeking. So now we call them the plaintiff. The defendant is the one being sued. Those are probably the two most important ones. Um, another one that I want to point out is damages. So when we say damages in a legal context, it means the amount of harm caused by the person who did the wrongdoing and the money associated with repairing that harm. It essentially means damages. Another word, uh, sorry, it essentially means um, costs. It essentially means loss, a quantification of loss. So the first distinction I want to draw is between torts and crimes. This will start to bring together what these torts actually mean. So a tort involves a wrongdoing that is a breach of a civil duty owed to another party. I say party because it could be between two people, it could be between two companies, it could be between a company and a person. Uh, a crime, on the other hand, is a wrongdoing that involves a breach of a duty that's prescribed by the country or the state. So for example, in the criminal code, there are rules about dumping, environment, uh, dumping waste into the environment. That is a rule that is a, if you breach it, that's a crime. On the other hand, you have something like punching somebody. That is not written down only in a code, but it's also part of the common law. Uh, it is a tort, which can be dealt with through tort law. So I, I give the example on the slide of the tort of battery between two parties. That is both um, a common law tort as well as a crime. So if somebody punches somebody, the person who gets punched can sue that person but at the same time, the state can also prosecute the person who did the punching. So it's both a tort and a crime. Um, and, but not all torts are crimes, and of course not all crimes are torts. And I'm going to give you a uh, description of some of the things that constitute torts in the next couple of slides. Um, in general, each tort has three essential elements. There are some exceptions depending on the type of tort. But in general, there are three parts to it. The first is there has to be a breach of an established common law duty. For example, um, in the case of punching somebody, the common law duty would be this. Don't punch people. That's the general rule. Um, you and I, we accept that people shouldn't be punching people. And so we have determined that if you do, that's a breach of the duty. So that's the first element. So in the case of a punch, it would be met out. Second one is intent. So usually on most torts, the person who is doing the tort has to have the intent to do the tort. That means they must have intended to cause the harm. So for example, in the case of a punch, again, the person doing the punch has to actually intend to punch the other person. If, for example, somebody picked up my arm and threw it at another person and it hit them in the face, then that would probably not be a tort because I didn't have the intent to punch. I was actually forced to punch. And so in the case of somebody throwing my arm, I don't think anybody could sue me for punching that other person because the second element of the tort was not made out. There was no intent. I did not intend to punch that person. On the third element, that is, there must be some harm. There must be some damage. There must be some loss. So in other words, if I punch somebody and say I did intend to do it and I just lightly graze them and it doesn't cause them any harm whatsoever and they're totally fine, they're not worried, then again, that tort probably wouldn't be made out because there was no harm done to them. Typically, a tort requires harm to be done. There are some exceptions to this and I, I listed one of them below there on the slide, but I won't get into it now. Um, so next I want to say, what is the point of tort law? So unlike criminal law, tort law is about restoring a person to the position they were in before. 
And so if you think of it with that lens, you can understand why people get money for suing each other for a tort. Its purpose, the purpose of tort law is to put the injured person back to the position they were before the tort was committed. So in the case of that punch, say the person has a, a broken jaw um, and it costs some amount of money to fix that broken jaw. Well, tort law would say that amount of money that it costs to fix the broken jaw, well, that would be the damage and that money should be paid back to the person who got hit. Um, in the case of criminal law, criminal law is not designed to restore people to the position they were in. It's more so designed by the state to punish the wrongdoer. So criminal law, the person who does the punch, the state might also charge them uh, by levying a fine or putting them in jail. And that's a different function. That's a punishment to deter that person's conduct in the future and also to deter other people from punching people. I mean, we don't want people running around punching each other. Um, that wouldn't be a productive system. There is a special case in tort law where additional money beyond restoration can be offered, and that's in the case of aggravated or punitive damages. That's where the conduct of the person who does the tort is so egregious or so bad that the court actually steps out of its way to award additional money to show that that conduct is bad. Um, it's, it's not a common thing. It usually only arises in the worst of circumstances. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the burden of proof. So I, I mentioned before, there were these three elements, okay? So for, to establish a tort, you have to prove these three things. One, two, three, that there's a breach of duty, that there's intent, usually, and that there's harm. On each of these elements, in order to prove that there has been a tort, it has to be proven on a balance of probabilities. What does that mean? It means that if a reasonable person is looking at this case of whether a tort has happened or not, the person has to conclude that there's a greater than 50% likelihood that the thing being alleged has happened. So for example, in the case of somebody punching somebody, um, the person who gets punched has to go to court and tell the judge, look, I was punched, um, here is my proof, I have a bruise, uh, I got my receipts for my, repairing my jaw, and this is my case for why I should get money from this other person who punched me. Well, the judge would look at that and probably say, okay, well, there's a receipt for repairing your jaw. That probably means you were punched. I think a judge in that case would say, I agree that on a balance of probabilities you were punched. The, the standard in torts is much, much lower than what's required in criminal law. In criminal law, the standard is called beyond a reasonable doubt. So it means that the judge can't have a reasonable doubt in their mind as to whether or not the person has proved um, the wrongdoing occurred. So receipts showing that the jaw was punched and also just my testimony showing that the jaw was punched, that might not be enough in a, in a criminal context, but it could be enough in a tort context. So here is a list of torts. This is not an exhaustive list, but I'm going to describe these ones because these are the more important ones that um, seem to happen more often and people get sued for, which I want to tell you about so that you don't run into them in your own uh, career. Um, I've listed them under two categories. There are the intentional torts and the other torts. The other torts, they may be um, non-intentional torts or have a different element to them that doesn't require intent. Under the intentional torts, I've listed assault, which is, I know this sounds a bit odd, but um, assault is not uh, an actual physical action. It's verbal, so it, it would just be verbal assault in the case of a tort. Battery, that's the physical action. You could think of it as physical assault. False imprisonment, which is taking people and you know putting them, uh, restricting them from going anywhere. Um, intentional infliction of nervous shock, that's scaring people. Conversion is stealing. And then the last one I've listed is intentional interference with contractual relations, which is, uh, and I have, I've got a case study on this a little bit later on, this is where somebody intends to ruin a deal or a contract that's being um, done by somebody else. Under the other torts, I've listed defamation, which is when somebody says something bad about somebody else that tends to lower their reputation. 
I've also listed nuisance, which is a loud noise or maybe a bad smell or something like that. And so, yes, you can sue people for loud noises or bad smells. Um, trespass to land, that's entering onto a piece of land that doesn't belong to you. Passing off, which is a very interesting one related to trademarks. It's where a person takes a good and then presents it as his own good, even though it's not. False imprisonment again, and I've listed it because it, it can fall under both categories. And negligence. Um, negligence is usually where engineers end up getting sued. I am not speaking about negligence. There's another lecturer who will speak about the uh, tort of negligence in detail, but I do list it here because it is a tort. Um, so the ones that you might deal with the most as engineers are probably um, negligence, number one, but you might also deal with assault and battery and interference with contractual relations as well. And as I say, I've got an example on that later. This is just a diagram I prepared to help explain the difference between torts and crimes. As I mentioned before, in the case of a tort, the, the money flows directly from person to person. Whereas in the case of a crime, usually the money flows from the person to the state uh, because it's the state who's doing the punishing. And for your reference later, I've, I've listed all the, the details and differences between the, the torts and the crimes, which I won't go through in detail on this. But instead, I'd, I'd rather get to an example question. So in this example question, I'll read it out, and then I've got a couple of, of questions afterwards to help you understand how the tort system works and how to prove these issues. So I'll read this out. Danielle and Peter are watching the new Bourne movie. Peter is texting his friends about how great the movie is. He's sitting in front. The sound and the light of Peter's phone annoys Danielle, who sits behind Peter. Feeling like she might be related to Jason Bourne, Danielle karate chops Peter in the head, causing him to drop and break his phone. Peter suffered no injuries other than, of course, to his ego. So I have some questions. What can Peter do? Can he do something about what happened to him? So he got chopped, he dropped his phone and it broke, and he had no damage to himself other than to his ego. Okay, that's the first question. What can he do? Well, Peter can sue. Peter can sue Danielle for the if you remember what this is called, the physical contact, that's the battery. So number one, he can sue her for battery. And number two, he can also sue her for breaking his phone. So he could possibly get, possibly, money for both of those things to put him back in the position he was before Danielle did the karate chop. So if Peter does try to sue, who needs to prove what happened? Who has the burden of proving the case? The answer to that question is the plaintiff. Who would be the plaintiff in this case? It's Peter. Peter is going to go to court to plead his case to say, I want money for the karate chop and I want money for my phone. Okay? So next question is, how convinced does the judge need to be in order for Peter to get his money? So this is a tort, as you remember, and in this case, it will be on a balance of probabilities a greater than 50% likelihood that everything that Peter says happened, happened. So the judge needs to be convinced on a balance of probabilities that what Peter says happened, happened. Okay? Next, what will Peter get if he wins? Well, there's two elements to this. Uh, as you remember, there's the chop and then there's the phone. So suppose Peter sues for the chop. What's he going to get? Well, as you remember from this uh, fact pattern, we saw that Peter suffered no injuries. So can Peter get anything for the karate chop? Probably not. Because there has to be some damage that's being compensated for. If there's no damage, then there's no compensation. So he can't get anything there. What about the phone? Well, if the phone was broken as a result of this chop, then Peter probably could sue and could be successful in getting money for his phone. So those two things are a little bit different because of the damages issue. The next question is, should Peter sue? Well, on a practical point, um, just to put this in perspective, typically to start a lawsuit, just to even start the lawsuit and get it into court, it might cost thousands. In order to bring that lawsuit all the way to completion, you know, to go to a trial and see a judge, maybe even have a jury, it might cost 50000 or 100000 And those costs are mostly related to legal fees paid to lawyers or disbursements, which are expenses related to the case, like paid to doctors. So the question is, should Peter sue for his phone? 
Probably not, because it wouldn't make any sense. He's going to sue for $500 and spend $10,000 to get there. It wouldn't make sense. This is one of the most um, common issues that arises when people come to me in my practice as a lawyer is they say, oh, well, you know, I suffered this wrong. Somebody stole my bicycle. Somebody broke my phone. Um, can I go after them for it? And my answer is you could, but the problem with it is you're not going to get any money as a result because it's going to cost you more money to get there. Um, so I often have to recommend to people not to sue. Unfortunately, the legal system is expensive. So you, I, I want to give you that advice so you can remember that in the future. If you are ever being sued or if you're ever worried about being sued, if the amount of money is quite low, then the chances of them suing you are also quite low. Likewise, in your case, if you want to sue somebody else, don't do it unless there's a lot of money involved. Um, all right, next question. Uh, this is actually related to a case that I have ongoing right now. So in my practice as an engineer, um, I often deal with construction law and I deal with engineering liability cases. So engineers often come to me when they're being sued or contractors come to me when they want to sue the developer for non-payment and so on and so forth. In this case, um, this was a case about an engineer who was being sued for both defamation and for um, intentional infliction, uh, intentional interference with contractual relations. So I'll go through the fact pattern. Eng Bob is a geotechnical engineer. He works for an owner who intends to build a house on a hilly property. The owner engages a contractor, Mr. Hardy, to do the excavation work to flatten these hills. Eng Bob notices that Mr. Hardy has no clue how to excavate. So Mr. Hardy tells Eng Bob that he's going to do extra work just so that he can bill the owner for the extra work. This actually happened. So he told the engineer that he was going to replace some of the dirt with really expensive rocks just because he could charge the owner for it. Obviously, this is not a good practice, and Engbob had something to say about it. Uh, Engbob then writes a letter to the owner telling the owner that Mr. Hardy has no idea what he's doing, and he also writes in the letter that Mr. Hardy's trying to take advantage of his contract with the owner. Well, what do you think the owner does? Obviously, he fires Mr. Hardy, uh, and he goes and he hires somebody else, and somebody else completes the work, which is what any reasonable person would do when they learn that their contractor is ripping them off. Unfortunately, Mr. Hardy didn't take too kindly to that, and he sued the engineer. So he sues him for a couple of things. Let's go through this. As I mentioned, I sort of gave it away earlier. What could Mr. Hardy sue Engbob for? So, number one, there was a letter written. The letter said to the owner some negative things about Mr. Hardy. So that could be defamation. That's the tort of defamation. Um, in particular, this is called libel. Libel is the written word that is defamatory. And I'll get into the details as to what um, the elements of defamation are just after I get the other tort. The second thing is, remember what happened to the contract? the owner canceled the contract with the contractor. So presumably the contractor was expecting to complete the work and get paid for it, but now he can't because the engineer told the owner that the contractor doesn't know what he's doing. That could be the tort of interference with contractual relations between the owner and the contractor. So coming back to the first tort, the tort of defamation... Um, the elements are this. There needs to be words that are said that tend to lower a person's reputation in the mind of other people. That's it. That's all that's required. There doesn't need to be proof in the case of defamation of actual harm. It's assumed that harm happens. In order to find out you know, how much compensation the person being defamed should get, you have to prove the harm. But in order to bring the lawsuit for defamation... That's it. That's all that's required. So if I say, um, you know, I, this contractor is no good at his job, that means that I could be defaming that contractor. The, the key to it, though, is in order to be successful, it actually has to be false. So if the um, engineer says statements about the contractor, in order for them to be defamatory, they have to be false statements. Obviously, if the engineer says about the contractor, hey, the contractor told me that he's trying to take advantage of the contract, 
then that can't possibly be defamatory because it's true. Um, then in the case of, you know, commenting on the uh, the workmanship of the contractor, well, you know, that's arguable. It's, it's a difficult thing to figure out. If the engineer says about the contractor, uh, his work isn't up to standard, well, the question is, what's the standard? And this is something that um, we're going to have to find out in court. Currently, this, this case is ongoing, and I don't actually know the answer to this. I think that the engineer is probably going to be successful on uh, defending from defamation because the contractor did say the things that he said. Um, but it depends. It depends on what turns out in the court and, and what the contractor can testify to. So this is another thing with lawsuits is it's, it's all very risky to bring a lawsuit because who knows how the evidence is going to come across to the judge when you go to court. But, you know, I hope that my engineering client is successful and we can um, prove that he hasn't committed defamation in this case. So uh, the other tort was the interference with the contractual relations. So what are the elements of this tort? Well, first of all, there has to be a contract between one party and another party. Secondly, there has to be some kind of interference by a third party, that would be the engineer. And then thirdly, there has to be intent to interfere with those relations. So then the question becomes, did EngBob interfere with the relationship between owner and Mr. Hardy? That's what needs to be proved. And who needs to prove that? Mr. Hardy needs to prove it. And I, again, I think he's going to have a tough time proving that because the engineer probably doesn't care what goes on between the owner and the contractor. He's just doing his job. He's just being a good engineer and reviewing the work and reporting to the owner on what happens. But this is um, you know, an example of how an engineer can get into trouble in a legal way in a very common situation. So as as advice for you, when you're writing stuff, be aware that whatever you write might be misconstrued by somebody and thought of as defamation if it harms their, their business interests. So it's always important as engineers to be very careful about who you're writing to and what you write in your letters. Um, my third question is, what damages would EngBob be responsible for if Mr. Hardy was successful? So on the first issue of defamation, what would the damages be? Well, they would be whatever losses Mr. Hardy has suffered. And so he would need to go to court and prove, well, as a result of this letter, my reputation has been harmed, and now I don't get as much business as I did before. The engineer would have to pay for that loss in business. Um, on the interference with the contractual relations issue, suppose the contract was worth 100 grand and Mr. Hardy only got 50. If Mr. Hardy was successful, the engineer probably would have to pay Mr. Hardy the other 50 because the argument would be Mr. Hardy lost the contract because of the engineer's comments. So again, this is how torts compensate people for their losses. Last question is, what will likely happen? In my opinion, because he's my client, I'm going to say it's not likely that the engineer is going to be responsible. I think we're going to be able to get him out of this. So that's everything I wanted to say about torts. If you have any questions about uh, this lecture, please reach out to your professor. Uh, it could be Scott Dunbar at this time, Professor Dunbar. Um, it could also be another professor, so reach out to him or her. Otherwise, feel free to contact me at the information below. And thanks very much for, for listening. Bye-bye.